live from Stanford University, it's theCUBE. Covering Stanford Women in Data Science 2020. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. And welcome to theCUBE. I'm your host, Sonia Tagari, and we're live at Stanford University covering the fifth annual WIDS, Women in Data Science Conference. Joining us today is Nusha Jami, who's the Director of Urban Water Policy for Stanford. Nusha, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your role. So I direct this Urban Water Policy Program at Stanford. We focus on building solutions to, for resilient cities. We try to use data science and also the mathematical uh, models to better understand how water uh, use is changing and how we can build future cities and infrastructure to address the needs of the people in the US, in California, and across the world. That's great. And you're going to give a talk today about um, how to build water security using big data. Sure. So give us a preview of your talk. Sure. So uh, the 20th century water infrastructure model was very much of a top-down model. So we built solutions or infrastructure to bring water to people. Um, but people were not part of the loop. They were not, the way that they behaved, their decision-making process, what they use, how they use it, wasn't necessarily part of the process. And we assume there's enough water out there to bring water to people and they can do whatever they want with it. So what we are trying to do is we want to change this paradigm and try to make it more bottom up uh, to engage people's decision making process and the uncertainty associated with that as part of the infrastructure planning process. Um, so I'll, be talk a, I'll talk a little bit about that today. And where is the most water usage coming from? So interestingly enough, in developed world, especially in the, in the Western United States, 50% of our water is used outdoors for grass and uh, outdoor spacing, which we don't necessarily uh, are dependent on, our lives don't depend on it. Um, I, I'll talk about the statistics in my talk, but um, grass is the biggest crop we are growing in the U.S. while we are not really needing it for uh, food consumption and also it uses four times more water than, uh, than uh, um, uh, corn, which wow. is which is a lot of water. And in California alone, if you just think about some of the spaces that we have, the grass uh, or green spaces we have outdoors in, the in, the, uh, in, in these uh, malls or uh, institutional buildings or different outdoor spaces we have, some of that water, if we can save it, they can provide water for about a million or two million people a year. So that's a lot of water that we can be able to, we can save and use or, or actually uh, repurpose for needs that we really have. So does that also um, boil down to uh, like uh, people uh, watering their own lawns or is it the problem for much bigger grass sure. usage? Actually, interestingly enough, that's only 10% of our water, outdoor water use. The rest of it is actually the residential water use, which is what you and I, the grass you and I have in our backyard, and uh, we're watering it. So that water is even more than that amount that I mentioned. Wow. So we use a lot of water outdoors, and um, again, uh, some of these green spaces are important for community building, for making sure everybody has access to uh, green spaces and kids can play soccer or play outdoors, uh, but really our individual lawns and outdoor spaces, if they are not really uh, native, um, uh, you know, landscaping, it's not something that we use enough to justify the amount of water you use for that purpose. So taking longer showers and all this stuff is, is very minimal compared to uh, no, not at all, actually. Those are also very, very important. That's another 50% of our water that we use in our urban areas. Um, uh, it is important to be mindful the way we wash dishes, the way we uh, take shower, the way we uh, brush our teeth and not wasting water while we're doing that. And a lot of other individual decisions that we make that can impact our water use on a daily basis. Right. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about right now in California. We just had a dry February, sure. which is the first in 150 years, and you know this is a huge issue for cities, agriculture, mm -hmm. and for potential wildfires. Sure. Um, so, tell us about your opinion about that. So, um, 
The, the 20th century infrastructure model I mentioned at the beginning, one of the flaws in that system is that it assumes um, that we will have enough snow in the mountains that would uh, melt during the spring and summertime and would provide us water. The problem is climate change has really, really impacted that assumption and now we are not getting as much snow, which is comes back to the fact that this February, we have not received any snow. We are in still in the winter and we have spring weather and we don't really have much snow on the mountain, which means that's going to impact the amount of water we have for summer and springtime. This year, we had a great last year. We got enough water in our reservoirs, which means that uh, we can potentially make it through. Um, but when you have consecutive years that are dry and we don't receive a lot of water precipitation in the form of snow or uh, rain, that will become a very uh, problematic issue uh, to meet future water demand in California. And do you think this issue is um, along with not having enough rainfall, but also about how we store water, or do you think there should be a change in that policy? Sure, I think that is definitely has something also in the way we store water. We definitely, we are in the 21st century, we have different problems and challenges. It's good to think about uh, alternative ways of uh, storing water, including using groundwater sources, groundwater as a way of storing excess water or moving water around faster and making sure we, we use every drop of water that falls on the ground and uh, also protecting our water supplies from contamination or pollution. And do you see us ever going to desalination in order to get clean water? So interestingly enough, I think desalination definitely has worked in other parts of the world uh, when, they have, when you have smaller population or you have already tapped out of all the other options that are available to you. Desalination is an expensive solution, uh, costs a lot of money to build this infrastructure, and also again depends on uh, you know, this centralized approach that we will build something and provide resources to people from, uh, from that location, so it's very costly to build this kind of solution. I think for, for California, we still have plenty of water that we can save and uh, repurpose, I would say. And also, we still can do recycling and reuse. We can capture our stormwater and reuse it. So there's so many other cheaper, more accessible options available before we go ahead and build a desalination plant. And you're going to be talking about sustainable um, water resource management. So sure. tell us a little bit more about that, too. So sustainable water resource management and... Uh, Occasionally I use also the word, word like building resilient water future. It's all about diversifying our water supply and being mindful of how we use our water. Every drop of water that we use, it's degraded and needs to be cleaned up and put back in the environment. So it always starts from the bottom. The more you save, the less impact you have on the environment. The second thing is you want to make sure every drop of water that we use, we can use it as many times possible and not make it, not, not take it, use it, lose it right away, but actually be able to use it multiple times for different purposes. Another point that's very important is actually majority of the water that we use on a daily basis is doesn't need to be extremely clean drinking water quality. For example, if you tell someone that we are flushing down to our toilets drinkable water, it would surprise you that we would spend this much time and uh, resources and money and, um, and energy to clean that water to flush it down the toilet without necessarily using it. So, so basically rethinking the way we built this infrastructure model is very important, being able to tailor water to the needs that we have and also being mindful of how we use the resource. So is your research focused mainly on California or the local community? We actually, uh, our, our, the solutions that we built are not California focused. Actually, we try to build solutions that can be easily applied to different places. Having said that, um, because we are working from a sort of a bottom up uh, way, we approach water from a bottom up, um, you need to have a local collaboration and local perspective to bring to the to this picture. And a lot of our collaborators have been so far in California. We have had data from them. We were able to sort of demonstrate some of the assumptions we had in California. But we work actually all over the world. We have collaborators in uh, Europe, in Asia, and they're all trying to do the same thing that we do, and we're trying to sort of uh, collaborate with them on some of the projects in other, co other parts of the world. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So going forward, um, what do you hope to see with sustainable water management? 
So to be honest with you, I would um, often we think about technology as a way that would solve all our problems and move us out of the uh, challenges we have. I would say um, technology is great, but we need to be really rethink the way we manage our resources and the institutions that we have and the way we manage our data and information that we have. And I really hope that we can revolutionize that part of the water sector and disrupt that part because as we disrupt this institutional part and uh, the system and provide more system level thinking to the water sector, I'm hoping that that would change the way we manage our water and then actually opens up space for some of these technologies to come into play as we move forward. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, before we leave here, um, you're originally from Tehran um, and, and now you're you're in this data science industry. What would you say to a kid who's abroad who, who wants to maybe move here and, and have a, 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 a career in data science? Sure. I would say study hard. Don't let anything to uh, discourage you. Uh, you know, we are all equal. Our brains are all made the same way. It doesn't matter what's on the surface. So, um, so I, I encourage all the girls to study hard and not get discouraged and fail as many times as you can because failing is an opportunity to become more resilient and learn how to grow. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and I really hope to see more girls and women in, this, in these engineering and STEM fields to be more active and become more uh, prominent. Have you seen a, a, a large growth within the past few years? Definitely, the conversation is definitely there and there are a lot more women and I love how uh, Margot and her team are sort of trying to highlight the number of people who are out there and working on these issues because that demonstrates that the field wasn't necessarily empty, it was just not, uh, not highlighted as much. Right. Um, so for sure, um, it's, a, it's very encouraging to see how much growth we have seen over the years, for sure. Nisha, thank you so much. It's really inspiring all the work you do. Thank you for having me, Sonia. Absolutely. Nice to meet you. I'm Sonia Tagare. Thanks for watching theCUBE and stay tuned for more.